Thank you. Thank you for the great introduction. Hello, Anyang uh, Haseyo. It's really a pleasure uh, to be here. I would like to start by thanking the organizers, not only for the opportunity to come visit Korea for the first time, for which I'm very thankful, but also for organizing a wonderful conference. I mean, I think the setup is really uh, excellent and things have, things have run very smoothly. So congratulations on the uh, great organization. Uh, I work at Sanadu and the mission of Sanadu is to build quantum computers that are useful and available to people everywhere. Every single employee of the company is encouraged to understand the role that they play in making this mission a reality. I am the head of the algorithms team at Sanadu, and for me answering that question, how do we contribute to this mission, is actually very straightforward because we focus on that word, useful, right? My job is to understand how to make quantum computers useful. And to me, that means answering one specific question, what to do with a quantum computer, right? And actually, I would like to do an exercise here, which is to ask you to put yourself in my shoes and try to answer that question. What would you do with a quantum computer? The theme of this conference is to build scalable quantum technology. Let's suppose that we achieve that goal, right? Let's suppose that our experimentalist colleagues, I'm a theorist, they're successful, right? And now the hardware is not a problem. We have logical qubits. We have as many qubits as we want. We can apply as many gates as we want. We got there, right? What do you do with a quantum computer? And I'm going to wait some time so that you actually think about it. What would you do? What task are you solving? What algorithm are you applying? What specific sequence of gates are you doing? And why is this thing that you're proposing going to change the world, right? Why, why was it worth it to build this technology to get there? Think about it for a second. And that's because that's what I do for a living. Think about this question. So my claim is that we don't have a good answer. As an entire community, as a species, we don't have a good answer to this question, right? And there's many reasons, but the main reason is that it's an extremely difficult question to answer for many reasons. First, most proposed answers, maybe even if you did this exercise, the answer that may have come to your mind was superficial, right? Oh, quantum chemistry, right? Machine learning. So the answers are very superficial. and going deep enough to have compelling answers means navigating very difficult areas that are interdisciplinary. So we need to understand the problems that we're applying quantum computers to. We need to understand how to program quantum computers. So we need expertise in quantum algorithms. Plus, we need to understand the classical methods that we're ultimately competing against. That's very difficult. Very few people have that expertise together. And so you need entire teams to actually tackle this, right? I'd also argue that despite the fact that we don't have a good answer to this question, it's a crucial question, Spe especially for a company like Sanadu, but any other quantum company that is trying to commercialize quantum computers, right? But even for academics and the entire field, right? It's a crucial question, and we don't have good enough answers, in my opinion. Um, having said that, I still need to answer that, right? This is my job. So this is kind of the mental model that I use to navigate to this question. If we are going to apply quantum computers to a specific task, then here's what I would like from that. First, it should be really impactful to industry. This is about generating value for people, especially for a company like Sanadu. This is what we want to do. So that is something that should be satisfied. Additionally, we want to look at problems that are actually very difficult for classical, right? If we already have good solutions, if we already have amazing systems, then why do we need quantum, right? So we need to satisfy that as well. And importantly, we also need to find problems that are actually like easy, quote unquote, for quantum, right? So where quantum algorithms should be capable of really solving these problems, right? In sufficiently small amount of time with sufficiently high quality. And so that's the goal, is to find problems that are right at that intersection. Important to industry, hard for classical, easy for quantum. And something that I did as an exercise is to basically search for proposed uh, applications of quantum computing. Maybe some of the th ones that you had in your mind when you were doing this exercise fall under this category. This is not meant to be exhaustive. This is not every single application, but it gives you an overview, right? And so what I like to do is to go, um, sorry, go back to the scheme and say, okay, let's classify them. Let's see of these proposed uh, applications, which of those are impactful to industry, which of those are hard for classical systems, which are th of those are easy for quantum, right? And my claim, and I know this is a little bit controversial, but it's literally an outcome of my job, is the following, is that I think most ideas are actually not very good candidates for quantum applications, right? And I have listed here, again, this is very, it's just an exercise to give you an idea of a point I want to make, 
Um, but it, everything on the right-hand side, I consider to be a weak candidate as an application for quantum computing, and the main reason is stated there in parentheses, right? On the other hand, the best promises that we have, first, short factoring algorithm, this is the thing we can know we can do with quantum computers, so that remains the thing, that would be my answer, just factoring, that's something that we know how to do. But other things that survive this filtering are really related to quantum chemistry and material science. So that's why the algorithm team at Senadu is largely focused on quantum chemistry and material science. And for those of you that are working in industry, working in research, in my experience, the main mistake that, pe the main mistake that people do in quantum algorithms research is that they underestimate just how incredibly good classical algorithms and computers are, so it's very difficult to beat, and they overestimate how good quantum computers can be, right? So we need to not make those mistakes to actually be successful in making quantum computers useful. Um, of these good candidates that we identified, uh, these are all good, that's part of the classification. At Sanadu and in my team, we have focused to really uh, concentrate on batteries, and the main reason is that A, the impact in industry is gigantic, so the battery market is huge. Second, uh, there's a lot of demand for better batteries. So not only is the impact big, but the people really want that impact to happen. But from a scientific perspective, uh, batteries have this great property that they are themselves very complex systems. So actually, even though we're focusing on a specific application area, so it seems, actually there's so much happening inside of a battery that it's really like a microcosm of all of material science of all quantum chemistry. So it's this beautiful balance where we are focusing without actually losing complete focus, right? Without having to like lose an opportunity cost of getting expertise in different areas. So that's why my team at Sanadu is focused on quantum computing for batteries, and that's why I'm giving you a talk about quantum computing for batteries. So that's the potential answer, right? There's still factoring, so that's always been there, but we understand that very well. So that's the question we're trying to uh, answer right now. Is the thing that we would want to do with a quantum computer to really generate massive value to potentially change the world to simulate batteries? I don't know. Let's find out, right? So just to elaborate a little bit more on the claims that I have made, the, this is the slide that I like to give to give a, uh, an overview of why the market for batteries is huge. Uh, Everyone here that has portable devices, uh, these are all running on lithium-ion batteries, right? I like to say that I didn't use, I have a, um, a drill, an electric razor, and an electric toothbrush, all of which also run on lithium-ion batteries. So it already is it's a technology that we all feel present in our life, right? Uh, it's also starting to become much more present in other areas, right? Famously in electric vehicles, uh, also in energy grid. Now. In every single area, either the technology is not good enough, right? Like for example, for large scale um, automotive and electric vehicles. But even in those where it already works really well, there's demand for even better, right? We all would love to have a cell phone where the battery lasts longer, where it's even safer, where it's cheaper, more lightweight, right? So there's huge demand for better uh, technologies. So there are, of course, many scientists around the world whose job is precisely to develop the next generation of battery technologies. And I really like this slide, which is taken from the, uh, the reference in the bottom, that is giving an overview of different approaches towards the next generation of batteries, right? So improving on the battery technology. For me, it's a lot of uh, parallels with quantum computing in the sense that there are a lot of different proposals that have great advantages, and that's a common theme, great advantages, and many challenges that they have to overcome, right? So for example, and this is kind of a random one, uh, chosen from all of them. Uh, there's this idea of lithium air or, or lithium oxygen batteries. What's fantastic about them is that they have my, much higher energy density. So you imagine a car that can run for a much longer distance, right, on a single charge, but they are terrible in terms of reversibility. Their lifetime is extremely small, uh, short. Therefore, it's not really a viable technology, right? And so what happens is that to fulfill the great demand from a large market, we need to solve scientific problems that are able to overcome the challenges of every single proposal for better battery technologies. Now, doing that is very difficult, and it requires many different components, but one of those relates to simulations of quantum mechanical systems, specifically materials involved in the battery, but also some of the reactions that happen inside of a battery. So simulation plays a key role. The main reason is that it's very expensive to do experiments, right? So we can't just simply understand systems by constantly doing expensive experiments. And 
Ultimately, this involves quantum mechanical calculations on classical computers. More concretely, this means solving the electronic structure of materials and molecules. And the main technique that is currently used is density functional theory. Right? So this is what we're competing against. Quantum computing is competing against DFT in the context of batteries. And well, remember when we were talking about something being hard for classical? Turns out that DFT is pretty fantastic, right? In, in fact, it's one of the great triumphs of computational science in the last decades. It's an extremely successful theory, and people and scientists routinely use it to compute several properties of batteries, like cell voltages, reaction mechanisms from ionic mobility, thermal electrochemical stability. It's overall a successful and widely used method. However, it relies on approximations. That's essentially something fundamental about the theory. And specifically in the context of batteries, it's understood that it systematically underestimates cell voltages. It s struggles in dealing with transition metals that are always present in the cathode, which is a very important component of the battery. And even things like thermal stability are very difficult to assess. In fact, one of the previous talks um, said that you know DFT um, was um, predicting a certain spin of one or something, but in reality they were measuring a different spin. That's really how it's like to work with DFT in my experience and talking to the experts. It's a great tool, but it's full of limitations, meaning there's a real demand for something better, something that can allow us to make these simulations with higher accuracy, and they're more reliable. So let's think, does quantum fit into the picture, actually, right? And fundamentally, the idea behind quantum algorithms for quantum chemistry and material science is that we can directly um, access and access the basic physics governing the systems, right? But more importantly, we know of specific algorithms uh, that can perform accurate simulation with some caveats, namely the ability to prepare good approximate ground states, but they can perform accurate simulations, for example, with chemical accuracy in, poly in polynomial time, right? So we do know that in principle, quantum computers are able to fulfill this task that we currently struggle to do with existing methods like DFT. And we know this because of algorithms like quantum phase estimation that have seen a lot of improvement uh, throughout the years with techniques of qubitization and first quantization, of which I will tell a little bit more in this talk. Of course, the challenge is, is that we don't really have hardware that's good enough to fulfill the promise of these algorithms. Um, it's still very challenging to prepare approximate ground states which are necessary for uh, these algorithms to be successful. And moreover, as you will see, the cost of these algorithms are very high. So the fact that whether it's easy for quantum computers to solve these problems is actually not yet clear. So let me tell you about the research that we've done at Sanadu in this direction, in understanding how we can apply quantum computers to batteries. And I would like to start with this quote from the abstract of one of my favorite papers in quantum computing. This is the, the paper that really proposed the idea of simulating the FEMO complex as a great application of quantum computing. In my opinion, we need more work like this, and certainly my team is trying to do work like this. And I will read the quote out loud. Although quantum chemistry is a strong candidate for a killer application of quantum computing, the lack of details of how quantum computers can be used for specific applications makes it difficult to assess whether they will be able to deliver on the promises. Namely, we need details on how we're using quantum computers to tackle these problems, to actually understand and to have compelling reasons that they will be able to reach that potential. Um, so that's exactly what we do, right? So I invite you to take a look at our paper. This was uh, done in collaboration with the team at Volkswagen. They have been amazing partners uh, in this journey and long-term partners, and we answer one question in this paper. How do you use a quantum computer to simulate key properties, so things that people actually care about, in a lithium-ion battery, right? And again, in the spirit of this quote, we go to great levels of detail in answering that question. So let me give you an overview uh, of our results. First, uh, we're talking about batteries. Uh, let me take some time to explain the basics of how a battery works. Uh, so now when you use your devices, you have a better understanding of how they actually function. There are three main components, the cathode, the anode, and the electrolyte. The anode, which is illustrated here on the right-hand side, it's typically graphitic carbon, so just layers uh, of graphite. And um, the cathodes, however, are a very important and crucial component of the battery. They're typically materials involving metal oxides, so some transition metal with some oxygen and potentially other elements as well. And typically they involve transition metals, right? 
Now, the role of the electrolyte is really to help the transport of ions from cathode and um, electrode and back and forth, depending on whether you're doing charging or discharging. And there's also this component of a separator that's really there just to prevent a uh, short circuit. Now, what happens during the operation of a battery? When the battery is fully charged, you know, you left it overnight, you left your phone overnight, battery's at 100%. What happens is that all the lithium is in the anode, right? And now if you connect it to, you know, to start functioning to some, to some source, then uh, what occurs, there's a reaction happening at the anode where the lithium loses an electron, and now these electrons create a current through the circuit that powers your device, and the lithium ions migrate towards the cathode. And so during this search, we have a flow of lithium ions from anode to cathode, right? During um, charging, it's the exact reverse process that occurs. The reason that a battery works is because there is an energy difference between those two different configurations, where the lithium is in the anode or where the lithium is in the cathode. And that's the basics of it. What's important to understand is that many of the properties of a battery are determined by properties of the cathode material. So the cathode material is a crucial component of the battery. Now, like I said, we are trying to understand how to tackle key properties uh, of a battery, right? These are many, so really simulating a battery and making simulations that relate to batteries, it's a very big field. So we concentrate on a few of them for the sake of this paper. We look at three main properties, the cell voltage, and this is proportional to the difference in free energy of the cathode material with and without lithium. Uh, ionic mobility, which determines essentially the charging rates of your battery, how fast and how well does it charge. And finally, thermal stability. So if you remember stories of batteries catching fire and being unsafe, that's something that of course is very important. And basically there are some reactions that are exothermic that can happen at critical temperatures. You want to make sure that those are high enough that they can operate safely in like the usual regimes that we actually employ the batteries, right? And what's important is that all these calculations reduce to computing ground state energies of especially the, materi uh, the cathode material. And this is what we know how to do on a quantum computer, right? As I explained previously. In a bit more detail, a bit of math. So like I said, the voltage, it's now related to energy differences when the uh, cathode, in this case we're using the example of lithium cobalt oxide, it's a very common cathode material, probably your phone is running on lithium uh, cobalt oxide. Basically you look at the, the difference where the lithium is all in the cathode, and when you have the cathode that's delithiated, not lithium, and the lithium is basically by itself in the, uh, in the anode. And similarly, if you want to compute diffusivity, which is determining, determining the ionic mobility, then you need to compute some uh, ground state energies. This ET E sub I is about a chemical reaction, so it's a reaction uh, rate that you're computing here. And same, cr the critical temperature involves, again, ground state energy calculations. So this is just to give you some more mathematical detail to the claim that I made previously that all these properties that we want to simulate, they can be related to problems that we know how to address on a quantum computer. So what we do in the paper is we looked at everything that humanity knows about using a quantum computer for different tasks, and we put them all together in answering that question, how in the world do you simulate a lithium-ion battery on a quantum computer? It was our assessment that the state-of-the-art algorithms that are suitable for material simulation, as essentially this paper from the uh, team at Google, it's a fantastic paper and I encourage you to take a look. And what's really interesting about this approach is that it's based on first quantization methods, right? And it heavily makes use of a plane wave basis for uh, representing uh, the Hamiltonians. And I will explain a little bit why this is important. It's a quantum phase estimation algorithm where we are encoding the Hamiltonian into a unitary using a cubitization approach, which again is state of the art. In first quantization, state preparation is more complicated. And in particular, we need to anti-symmetrize the state. So we also talk about how to prepare the state. And we do this using block atomic orbitals and essentially um, uh, preparing a, um, the hard to fox state using rotations uh, to prepare arbitrary single layer determinants. And importantly, in our work, we give a detailed um, description, again, in the spirit of the quote that I mentioned pre previously, of every single step of the algorithm, right? Now, um, just a little bit more uh, mathematical details for those of you that are interested. Now, 
plane waves, this is the equation, and maybe I can use the pointer, which is this equation here on top. Maybe you cannot see too much, just the first equation. So it's a very simple thing. Here GP is a vector of the reciprocal lattice for the experts in the room. And the reason to use plane waves is that A, they capture the periodicity of a material. Second, they lead to Hamiltonians that have a very small norm. And importantly, because some of the expressions are known analytically, it leads to much um, shorter and easier compilation um, for the cubitization operator that is crucial for performing quantum phase estimation. So it's really like useful for reducing the cost of the quantum algorithm to use plane waves. Second, representing states, this is the second equation in my slide. In first quantization, it's more complicated. So what you do is for every single particle, you specify the state that it's occupying, right? And now you antisymmetrize the entire state. And so that gives you one, what is known as a single Slater determinant. An arbitrary state is a superposition of such states. And finally, the final equations that you see here, these are the different components of the Hamiltonians, the kinetic energy and the Coulomb terms. And even if you don't understand the details of this expression, what's important is that the, the coefficients that appear and that determine kind of the matrix um, entries of the, each of these terms, they're known in analytical form and they're relatively simple. And again, this has a huge impact in the overall cost of the algorithm. Uh, one of the things that we do in our paper, and that was one of the missing pieces of the puzzle, was really specifying how to prepare uh, this approximate ground state. This is crucial for quantum phase estimation algorithms. So we took all the work to do this, essentially, um, and again, this is particularly challenging in first quantization methods where you need to explicitly anti-symmetrize the state. Um, so we consider a common approximation, the Hartree-Fox state. Uh, to prepare the Hartree-Fox state, so to perform the optimization of the orbitals, we actually don't use plane waves. We use um, a set of Way, uh, of basis functions known as block atomic orbitals, and specifically we look at the gamma point approximation. These are technical things, but I'm mentioning for comp concreteness. So we perform the, the optimization, the hartree fock method in the specific basis, and then what we do is rotate back to a plane wave basis. And this is done leveraging Thule's theorem, which is the third line that you see here. And this essentially tells us that to prepare these type of states, this is again a single Slater determinant, we can actually perform this efficiently because all the operations happen at the level of the fermionic operators. So the complexity of the system actually grows linearly with the number of orbitals, not with the dimension of the Hilbert space. Um, and to achieve this, we had to come up with a specific way of implementing what is known as a Gibbons rotations in first quantization in such a way that they preserve anti-symmetry. So long story short, one of the missing pieces of the puzzle on how to simulate these key properties is how to prepare approximate ground states for materials in first quantization, and so we answered that question in our paper. Now let me give you an overview of the results as applied to a specific use case. So we're looking at one type of cathode material, it's a realistic cathode material called dilithium iron silicate. Uh, it has been studied because it has high thermal stability, but importantly because of the huge abundance of um, iron and silicon. There's a lot of issues in batteries that relate to environmental and political reasons because the materials that, um, that are used, especially for the cathode, are pretty scarce and aren't always sourced in a sustainable way. So there's also a sustainability motivation for studying this uh, material. So it's for relevance, but also the unit cell is particularly simple, which makes the quantum algorithm easier to analyze. It's still a large system, so we're trying to do simulation of a unit cell with 156 electrons. And remember, we're trying to make claims that we can do something that classical systems struggle to do. So there's at least some evidence in the literature that says, hey, if you use DFT calculations, even the best ones that people try to do, it again, underestimates experimental voltages, right? So we do not have methods to have reliable estimates for the system, meaning it's a good example of uh, a use case where quantum computing could potentially lead to higher accuracy. Now, these are some of the results. So now we're doing a resource estimation exercise. We cannot implement these algorithms, but we can at least quantify how difficult it would be to actually implement them, right? So this is, this is like what we would have to do to achieve this promise of quantum computing, of having accurate simulations of these materials. Um, so we use this work from one of our collaborators. Uh, it's called T-Fermion, so it's a software library for doing resource estimation. Here, because we're focused on a fault tolerant uh, setting, the cost of the algorithm is usually captured by the non-Clifford gates, and in particular, most of the gates that you use, if not all of them, are Toffoli gates, so that really captures the cost of the algorithm. So that's what you see here on the um, y-axis. 
Now, the cost of initial step preparation is actually quite substantial. It's also very big, but it's still one or two orders of magnitude smaller than the cost of quantum phase estimation. So it's, even though in first quantization it's very expensive to prepare the initial states, it's not a deal breaker, right? And these are the results. And what you see here is actually um, plotting as a function of the number of plane waves for different target errors. This blue point is actually below chemical accuracy. So that's kind of like the, even the, the highest level of accuracy that we can aim to achieve. That will be well below what classical DFT methods can achieve. And you'll see that the numbers are enormous, right? And we need thousands of logical qubits to realize this. And this is typical, by the way. People that do this kind of exercises, they also realize and they show similar uh, numbers. It's a little bit difficult to parse the like, number of Toffolis. So something that we do, even though it's very like, difficult to do properly, is to give an estimate in terms of runtimes. How long would it take to implement this algorithm on a full-term quantum computer? Um, here we fix a specific error of 0 0.043 electron volts. It's kind of one of those in the middle type of accuracy targets. And we make these translations from number of Toffolis to runtimes for different rates of the quantum computer, right? So here we're assuming that a, this quantum computer can apply logical operations at a specific rate. And this is what you get. So you'll see that if you want a very large number of plane waves uh, and you have a very slow quantum computer, you're in trouble. If somehow you can get away with a small number of plane waves, which is not clear that you can do because you lose actual you actually lose accuracy, then, uh, and if you have a fast quantum computer, then maybe you can get some kind of realistic runtimes of a day or so. But the cost of the quantum algorithms remain very large. And again, this is typical of every single exercise in trying to quantify the cost of quantum algorithms. So let me give you a bit of an outlook. For us, this was an initial work in this longer term direction of studying how quantum computers can be applied to battery simulation as an important proposal for an application of quantum computing that can be useful and impactful. The goal of my team is to be the world leader in quantum computing for batteries, right? And we're in good shape to actually do it. Uh, we have a dedicated research program. It's happening uh, internally, but also in collaboration with our partners in industry and academia to improve the performance of quantum Algorithms, right? We've heard a lot of talks during this conference about how we need to get better hardware. Well, you know what? We also need better algorithms, and that's my job. Uh, part of it is identifying killer applications, how to extract maximum value from a quantum computer, and also keeping our mind open about potential discovering new and groundbreaking techniques. So it's not just taking ideas that have been developed and trying to improve them, but also having completely new ideas. And we do all this work, like I said, alongside industry and academic partners. These are all our goals. And ultimately, we want to generate valuable IP for the company. We want this to lead to new software products as part, for example, of our Penny Lane library. But overall, we want ourselves and our partners to be ready for the emergence of quantum computers that are capable of having real impact, right? And we need a lot of work to still get there. What are the challenges to achieve these goals? Uh, and in other words, what are we working on right now? Uh, initial state preparation, which is crucial for quantum phase estimation algorithms, this remains a problem. We really don't know, even though we gave a specific technique on how to do this, we still don't know if the overlap with the true ground state is sufficiently high to make this runtimes actually realistic. It's very difficult to quantify that and to have assurance that you have something that's good enough. So we need better initial state preparation methods. We're working in that direction. Now, we're confident for many reasons that we can still reduce the cost of quantum algorithms, but it's unclear by how much this can be done because there are fundamental limits, right? So we may need fundamentally new ideas in quantum algorithms to make them practical. Either way, and this is a lesson that maybe everyone can take, for quantum computers to be really Im impactful and useful, very likely they will need to be fast. If we have slow quantum computers, we're in trouble. We don't have good enough quantum algorithms and there are fundamental limits that may prevent their huge impact if they are slow. And again, even though I mentioned some important properties of batteries that can be addressed in principle with a quantum computer, um, it's still not clear that that's what you would like to do to unlock a huge value, right? In fact, in my opinion, uh, and we're discovering this even more and more, is that potentially the questions that can actually lead to like this new generation of batteries 
right? That if somebody actually discovers how to build a better battery and commercializes it, they can make a lot of money and generate a lot of value. That is probably closer not to simulating how a battery works, but just understanding more fundamental properties of materials. So it's more about materials discovery than battery simulation, potentially. Um, and on a more technical side, we're learning that to really accurately capture the properties of materials, you often have to treat very large unit cells, meaning you have a even harder to tackle, right? So the cost is always only going to, to be increasing. So we have a lot of work to do as well, uh, but that's the job of my team. And it's precisely the type of work that we hope to do in partnership with industry and academia. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions? My mouth is so dry, the mask. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's very uh, informative talk. Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering. Uh, so I probably oh, one of the questions I probably missed some of your your talk, and I, I just want to uh, I will appreciate if you can you know discuss how how many plane wave bases are required to achieve a certain accuracy again. And another one is uh, that uh, okay. So let me uh, get ask the first question first. Okay. Thank you. Yes, uh, it's an excellent question and, of course, very re relevant for us. It depends on the system, of course. Um, typically, what people do um, using methods like the EFT, they perform some convergence estimates. So you basically want to increase and increase um, like your basis set, your number of plane waves, until you see that whatever energy calculation you're making, it may be the wrong one, but at least it's converging, meaning that at least the basis is now capturing the properties of the system. Uh, so it depends, but typically you need millions or more of plane waves. If you're using this kind of like all electron approaches, part of what we're doing is exploring also the use of pseudo potentials, and there you can potentially need much fewer um, plane waves, maybe tens of thousands, a hundred of thousands, but it's quite large numbers, and that's one of the reasons why it's very crucial to use first quantization techniques. In second quantization, you will need as many qubits as there are plane waves. So we will be talking about hundreds of thousands to millions of uh, logical qubits. In that case, then, uh, the, I'm just curious about it. when uh, Xanadu hardware can achieve that level of, uh, you know, uh, Three to five years from now. No, um, that was a joke, by the way. The, um, I mean, we don't know. The, um, again, you shouldn't think, so let, let me answer the question by kind of changing <laughs> the answer to some extent. The whole point of my team is to bring down these numbers. Right? So, so I don't think it's the right question to say, like, okay, here's the algorithm, and this is fixed. When is the hardware going to get there? We need improvement on both sides. Right? So I'm hoping to get numbers lower to, like, double digits in the number of qubits and to have Toffoli gates that are below numbers like 10 to the 12. Right? Uh, when are we going to get there? I mean, that's the, the question of the entire field. Certainly, the team at Sanadu has plans of all the steps to get there. And we have an aggressive plan to reach at least a million physical qubits within this decade, for sure. And the second question, if I have a time. <laughs> so yeah, just uh, so Does, does yeah. electron transport important in this kind of a material? Uh, sorry, electron transport? Electron tra transport problem, yeah. Um, I'm not sure if electron transport per se, but definitely like studying ionic mobility, right? So, so, so the mobility of the lithium ions is certainly very important. Uh, it's not like one of the bottlenecks for what the highest demand of performance in batteries. That's mostly things to do with, um, with voltage, energy density, and with um, like lifetime and safety and cost. But it is actually important to study like transport of ions, at least, not so much electrons. Okay, so one of the, my specul specul speculation was that the, uh, the reason why you uh, need so many uh, the plane wave uh, basis is to, uh, to describe the electron transport, but they probably it, it, it is not the case. Not in, really. No, it's simply so. The problem with plane waves is that they um, they're not centered at the nuclei, where the so when people often use different type of bases, they have those that are centered, and so that allows you to have fewer of those. Um, and so actually to be, have a good representation of the actual wave functions. The, the actual wave functions of the systems look very different than a plane wave. So you typically need a lot of them to converge to those kind of weird shapes. 
right? So mm -hmm. it's, it's more fundamental in terms of trying to use a basis that is a bit different from the thing that you're trying to represent. Okay, okay thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Any more questions? Yes, uh, thank you. Oh. Thank you for the excellent talk. Thank you. Um, I guess I was curious in the sort of, uh, when you listed all the applications that were hard and easy, yeah. and uh, factoring was listed on one of the uh, presumably easy applications. So it's clearly not something regarding this algorithm. So, so I was curious, uh, what was your criteria for something being easy or hard if it's not about needing a fault tolerant quantum computer? For example, quantum finance was listed as hard. So. How, uh, how was the criteria chosen between what was easy and what was hard? Yeah, of course. So, again, I'm, I'm being provocative with this uh, slide, of course, but it, it does reflect the process that led to our focus in the team. Um, really, the, the criteria is essentially what I tried to convey in the talk. So we're asking, is this important for industry? Um, how good are current classical algorithms? How well can quantum actually tackle these problems, right? So for example, if you're mentioning quantum finance, roughly what happens is that it's not clear that quantum is good at this, hmm. right? It's not clear that first, that the computational challenges that people face are that great, that are important, and even when they are, and sometimes they are, that these are the kind of problems that is a good fit for quantum. It's not clear that quantum can now compete with what we can do classical. So that's the drawback. That's the part that's not so promising. And, and so forth with all of them, right? For machine learning, it's like, of course it's, it's wouldn't it be amazing if we could kind of transform quantum, uh, sort of machine learning with quantum computers? But the reality is that machine learning is fantastic. It's amazing. So I am scared of going against them, <laughs> right? 